Neurodiversity has been, and still is, an important element of the rhetoric we use to advocate for autistic people's rights and to help extend awareness and acceptance to people in the mainstream world. Whether you've been an active voice within the autistic community, a passive reader, or even a detractor to the cause, you, as I, have likely noticed some changes within the world of autism, particularly related to the idea of neurodiversity. We started off with some changes to how we like to be referred to, shifting from person first to identity first language, and essentially taking ownership of autism as an inherent part of who we are. That's not to say it is favoured by every single autistic person. The term Asperger's quickly changed from a simple diagnostic label, allowing like-minded individuals to congregate, into a symbol of the atrocities committed not so long ago. To many, it can symbolise an unwanted segregation between autistic people with differing support needs. Over time, we've had socio-political battlegrounds emerge between autistic adults, parents and charities, encouraging us as a community to take a stance against things such as curative research, ableism and the many, many inequalities that we face as autistic people. As positively as neurodiversity has been for the autistic community, it's definitely not without its ideological flaws when it comes to the generalised doctrines that it stands for. Welcome to my autiverse friend, I'm Thomas Henley, and I know you aren't here for a comprehensive breakdown of the history of the socio-political changes within the autistic community. So let's tackle the large issues at hand, particularly around neurodiversity. Neurodiversity, put simply, is a descriptor of a neurological diversity, aka the differences in the human brain. If you're a fan of science or ecology, you may know about biodiversity, but instead of the different species of fauna, insects and animals, it's the variation in the types of human brains. The potential origins of neurodiversity as a concept tend to vary, but roughly come from the late 20th century. Many argue that this came from within the autistic communities, within the advocate circles, but it was brought to light in academia by Judy Singer. The whole neurodiversity idea has been replicated in other disability circles, but also reflected in the past too seen in such movements like Mad Pride, the Hearing Voices community, or within the capital D deaf communities. Before we take a stroll through the use and applications of neurodiversity in the socio-political world, let us go over some terms, just so that everyone's at a point that we understand what we're talking about. Because there are a lot of like fancy words and like everything just seems to be changing nowadays, and I imagine that it can be very hard for a lay individual to sit through these types of videos without understanding where exactly the terms are coming from. Neurodivergence is meant to describe something different about a person or a human brain, and neurodivergent is there to describe someone who has a neurodivergence. Neurodivergence, the thing, neurodivergent, the person. <laughs> Neurotypical was once and is still frequently used by autistic people to sort of group or label people who aren't autistic, but it generally means someone without any neurodivergence. Holistic is the term created to fill in that logical gap. So holistic would be people who aren't autistic, meaning that they could have ADHD, they could be OCD, they could be neurotypical for sure, but um, just not autistic. <laughs> Throughout this video, when I say neurodiversity movement, I mean the push we give to mainstream society to change its perspectives, what we stand for and what we fight for. The neurodiversity paradigm is different to neurodiversity, which is a label, and the paradigm being somewhat a counter to the idea of pathologizing differences in the human brain under the pathology paradigm. A lot of words, I know, but they will be explained soon and used in various contexts. 
Now that the majority of autistic people have skipped through my ramblings and keyboard happy detractors have roasted me in the comments for my silly made up words, let us dive into the juicy nuggets of controversy that I have for you here today. The politics of science versus identity. It's a complex game when the medical system gives rise to labels that we use for our social identity. Generally, you get diagnosed for stuff when there's an issue related to it. So you could argue there's lots of neurodivergents who don't, and therefore do not receive a label unless they self-identify. It's no lie that the autistic community has been at odds with the scientific community for a very long time. Scientists and psychologists are responsible for illuminating autism as an actual thing, and this allowing us to congregate, advocate and address inequalities, not to mention give us access to supports and rights, even alternative communication methods and teaching methods, which some, albeit, how do I put this, aren't the most palatable to the autistic community. You know what I'm talking about. There's a strange dance that I've had the pleasure of observing between the relatively grey socio-political world of autism and the very black and white certainty-based approach of the scientific community. The scientific community desires a sense of certainty, order and a process to whatever they do, making lines in the sand or dividing human beings into categories based on clinical presentation. The socio-political world of autism, on the other hand, is just a tad bit more flexible, drawing in concepts from outside of the sciences, despite how its flexibility, concepts and ideologies emerge in and out of popularity, making it a large battleground of politics and often quite socially dogmatic. The more logically minded individuals like myself may enjoy the comfort of certainty that the scientific community offers, but there is, of course, a, a lot of grey areas in psychology. Despite its use of statistics and the scientific method, it's not like neuroscience, biomedicine, physics or maths. There are many roots of input from current culture, the individual mindsets of the actual practitioners, philosophy and much more. Making it, although perhaps a little bit more concrete and lining in the sandy, still not completely black and white still with a lot of potential grey areas, misunderstandings, a lot of human input, human bias perhaps. Humans observe traits and come up with concepts to explain them, but all diagnoses have pretty large margins of error and potential biases. Just consider the amount of autistic women and autistic people in general who have flown under the radar for much of their life or even those detained in hospitals misdiagnosed and treated with intense psychiatric drugs for things that they don't actually have. For a long time, neurodiversity was a banner in the war between the scientific and lived experience advocacy communities, the medical model of disability versus the social model of disability, the pathology paradigm versus the neurodiversity paradigm. By design, the medical model isolates and treats differences deemed pathological, indeed missing out on those who do not show pathology. With physical conditions and diseases, this works pretty well, but the human brain and the psyche is very, very complex, and I would argue a lot more intrusive and controversial to make value judgments on. The medical model places blame of the disorder on that person's brain, that person's brain difference which to the lay person and to many others makes a lot of sense. They have something that's wrong with them. This is the cause of the, the negative experiences that they have in life. It works on the basis of the pathology paradigm, something which aims to fix and treat diagnosable human differences deemed to deviate from social norms or societal expectations in a perceived negative way, or even to an extent, cause that person discomfort, harm, sort of hinder their progress within the world. However, things are just a little bit more complex than that, as many conditions highlighted have a very large social component to them. Our world is indeed built around the norm, and inequalities for different people may arise as a result of varied 
mixes of inherent disorder and social consequences of being different. And this is where the concept of the social model of disability comes in. Although the modern conceptualization is just as black and white as the medical model is to its detriment, this adds in the much needed context to how a disorder manifests in reality, and at least encourages a focus on fixing social issues around it. I'd argue for the case of autism, these are pretty large social issues indeed. Under the banner of the neurodiversity paradigm, these differences are seen as a natural human variation, not as a disorder that needs to be fixed or treated. Now, this may sound like a very enticing concept, and I'd argue very applicable to autism, but I think it's got a fair few flaws to it. The origins of what we call autism come from the medical model, and so that we can thank them. But let's not forget that the decisions made on treating and curing autism pose a pretty great threat to potential autistic lives. When push comes to shove, who should have the say in such a decision? The scientists, the government, or autistic people? Neurodiversity was once a movement, a part of this war between the medical and social worlds, encapsulating what is now referred to inherent neurodivergence, meaning you're born with a difference, like autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, being a few things, a few of these such differences that are highlighted. The flag of the neurodiversity movement was a movement on the side of the social model, arguing for the continued existence of different people and more social rights in the face of a world who seeks to see our difference as a plague on humanity. It brought to the table the idea that such things as autism carried a bunch of both inherent negatives and positives, but also questioned the true cause of these negative things, questioning the locus of the disorder, perhaps, and placing it on structures outside of that person. Are they the result of unfair discrimination, be it from ignorance or just purposeful discrimination, or are they a result of a pathological condition of the mind? There are, of course, some, and indeed many, who see this need to bargain one's worth as a human as despicable. And I'm inclined to agree. Now, I want to highlight that I do not speak for autistic people. I'm not a spoke, I'm not the autistic messiah. I'm just a Yorkshire lad who's autistic. <laughs> Indeed, some believe autism is a curse, and I'd be moronically hypocritical as a lived experience advocate to argue against their lived experience. I do want to make that clear. Individuals are individuals and must be treated with respect. Autism to me is ego dystonic. I do not like being autistic. Um, I have to accept, obviously, that I am, and that is nothing I can do about it. But I cannot like being autistic. Um, I will never like being autistic. How can I possibly like being autistic when it stops me doing so many different things that I'd otherwise want? Um, I'd much rather be able to meaningfully connect with other people because it's bloody lonely being autistic. Today I am not seeking out to target individuals or, or indeed attack anything, but merely to start a dialogue around my perceptions of our current culture related to neurodiversity and related to how we sort of talk about autism, how we conceptualize what autism is. Over time, the neurodiversity movement has shifted in a variety of different ways, becoming more and more encapsulating of difference and melding in with other similar social movements, namely the multifaceted social justice, human rights, and disability rights movements. A lot of advocates also insert various political stances into their ideology, changing the way that they argue and explain its tenets, which I don't particularly agree with. Not that I don't agree with the political stuff, I just don't agree with combining it into conceptualization of autism. You see, the cornerstones of disability conversation, particularly in the online spaces, is that disability is not a dirty word. 
or something that needs to be fixed or treated. I agree wholeheartedly with this notion as disability, just as a thing, is partly relative to the norms of our society. To many people, the word disability is a reclaimed word, despite the syntax and the actual meaning of the word being of, of a negative origin. The problem with the original neurodiversity movement and how people were advocating from it is that it conflicts with a lot of the tenets of the disability movement in some various ways. The neurodiversity movement advocated for autism and such conditions as being a natural part of human variation and diversity, speaking to the positives and negatives it offers, but also fighting for a status of general neutrality in some form. It almost, in a sense, argues for competency and the worth of different people, in the face of people thinking that it isn't. However, the disability movement accepts disability, seeks to encourage acceptance of one's disability, and fights for the rights of any said individual without a need to debate. No debate needed. Much more simple, straightforward, and inclusive, right? The thing is, to many lay individuals in different shades of grey, disability is not seen as a good thing, but something to treat, something to prevent. The disability rights movement rightfully fights for self-autonomy and human rights for those individuals. There is no question of this. It is incredibly valuable to enforce these human rights, and disability must be understood for what it means to disabled people. So let's have a look at some of the things that come under this neurodiversity paradigm, and I'll try and dissect and explain my own perspective on them. Number one, neurodiversity, all neurodiversity, is natural and valuable. I think this is a strong statement to say the least. Placing positive value on what's considered neurodiversity, meaning any difference in the brain, to put it plainly, whilst it's natural, many things are, and I would argue that all neurodivergency is not inherently valuable or even neutral. I will of course elaborate later. 2. There is no such thing as an ideal. I think I can agree with this one, as ideal is very subjective and differs greatly based on a multitude of different factors. Number 3. There is no such thing as normal. Whilst this is true, there isn't a normal human brain that we can point to. The thing is, normal is usually used as a general average of things, an aggregate of the traits in society, if you will, meaning that the most prevalent traits are those deemed to be normal. So normal is a thing, but it doesn't need to be a dirty concept, despite how annoying it can be when it's used in a social setting. Number four, we shouldn't assign value judgments on differences. I do agree with the general sentiment of this. I don't think we should seek to place a value on human life differently, but I do think we should discuss the impacts of said differences on the person and also others around them, using nuance and discussion to reach general conclusions about a variety of different differences. It's nothing to do with placing the value on an individual life, however. Despite what we would like, nearly all humans make judgments on things. And I think trying to argue that we shouldn't and we should just try to ignore it is quite silly. Not to say some judgments aren't completely illogical and lack massive objective flaws. This brings us to an important distinguishing factor between the sort of old neurodiversity movement, if you could call it that, and the newer neurodiversity aims. In the old movements, there was a focus on particular inherent psychological disabilities, which I'd say could be argued for people to view them as a state of difference or, or neutrality. In the new, all differences must be accepted as neutral with the lived experience of individuals being enough of an argument full stop. One seeks to change minds and debate on a select group of differences through logic, evidence and experience, 
The other enforces neutrality on all difference based on a sort of set of widespread doctrines. Personally, from my own experiences in lots of different settings, I believe that the world won't truly see neurodiverse individuals as more than charity cases or people who battle against or are succeeding against hardship. Unless we show people that neurodivergence is a neutral and natural variation in human beings and that is somewhat useful to the world. Most people just won't simply shift their perspective otherwise. It's not a nice reality. I'm not saying that I'm all for it at all, really. It's just a genuine observation of how humanity is and how our society is at the moment. I'm not also appealing to this idea of capitalism, as many will point out, as a source of one's usefulness. You know, all life to me has value and people can add value to the world in other ways than bolstering any said business's workforce. General society is simple in its assessment of such things. It sees both struggle of the individual, the potential burden on others, or the gifts a difference brings. Of course, there are a number of supporters involved, which one could argue the new neurodiversity movement approach does well, you know, due to its increase of uh, breadth of diagnoses that people are advocating for. I think we must ensure human rights, but also personal and individual choice over one's identity and bodily autonomy. I don't want this message to be lost, honestly. When talking generally about anything, it will naturally be disputed quite a bit. For we are all different. We all have different brains, different experiences, and, and the looseness of the bounds of what we consider to be autism is pretty clear to me. The neurodiversity paradigm seeks to erase all assumptions of pathology, which for sure allows more enforcement of individual choice. But the issue I have is that choice is and should exist under the pathology paradigm too, only when that person is at risk of themselves or other people. Or if a disorder has a significant objectively negative impacts on that person. There are already practices which seek to help those who are diagnosed accept themselves and work with their diagnosis. It's not like everyone everywhere or the doctors and medical establishments and psychologists are trying to intertwine and sort of change the autistic brain. It's a lot of the time teaching them how to cope and sort of live in a world that's not built for them. Albeit there are some medical professionals who do, <laughs> and those people I do have an issue with. Some argue that it is painful or shameful to be labelled disordered, since those who identify with the actual difference take it as an insult to who they are as a person. I would agree in my case with autism, but I don't identify with everything that I experience. Depression and anxiety being too huge examples. I experience them, but don't identify with them. I was born autistic. It is every corner of my existence, just as being human is. I think it's different to mental illness. Well, at least in my opinion. A name is of course given to psychological manifestations. Autistic people are not born with a big red A on their forehead. Thank the Lord. <laughs> Nor are we diagnosed based on blood tests or brain scans. Neurological conditions still hold many, many mysteries just as the human brain does, and psychology is not as black and white as people like to make out. For me, I don't see autism generally as an inherent disorder. I believe wholeheartedly in the power of the social model of disability and the neurodiversity paradigm. We are disabled. I won't dispute that, but to what end is this disorder that we experience inherent to our actual being? Well, we won't know until some of the in inequalities are rectified and proper moral effective systems are in place to support our lives. Hopefully that will happen soon. However, looking at a general scale, we should be wary of accepting all difference under the banner of a social movement 
instead of seeking its treatment. And of course, leaving you on a cold one, I will elaborate later. <laughs> Aspie Supremacy and the Untouched Line Aspie Supremacy is a relatively new concept, termed to describe the belief of superiority in intelligence, uh, worth or competency, by those who consider themselves to be ASD1 or ASD2. People like myself with relatively lower support needs to our ASD2 or 3 counterparts, who have a lot more support needs. The concept Aspie Supremacy is born out of a similar set of founded beliefs to the term's founder. It's clear that it's not a popular term, and since has been removed from the DSM-5, so it's not even used clinically either. However, I uphold the belief that those who wish to refer to themselves as an Aspie are not doing so in support of a superiority divide within a diagnosis or the support of an evil. I, like many, still have the diagnosis on my record, and I would argue the term Aspie has been reclaimed from its roots for a long time now. But this isn't to mention the existence of the term Asperger's in public knowledge. Most blink, double take and question when I refer to myself as autistic, but Asperger's tends to communicate this better in my own past experience, leading to less miscommunications. This isn't to say that I still use the label, but only to uphold an individual's personal preferences on how they identify. There is already much disparity on preferred terminology within the autistic community, despite how diligently some people may enforce their preferred terms. It's still not very clear what everybody wants to be referred to or called. Speaking on the topic of hand, as mentioned, the original neurodiversity movement led by the social model of disability carries a desire to prove the concept of what I'd argue as neutral, natural variation through debate, evidence and testimonials. There are, however, individuals who are severely intellectually disabled, who lack the skills of autonomy, struggle every day with anxiety brought from our world and their own bodies and the lack of access to what many consider to be the fruits and sort of spice and the adventures of what the world has to offer. To say autism is neutral or even positive in value only lands true for a portion of autistic people in some people's opinions. In the eyes of many outsiders, this creates a divide between people, especially between autism advocates like myself and particular groups of online parents. Personally, I don't believe that one's contribution to society proves their value. Human life is human life. If we judge someone's life lesser, well, it's a pretty slippery slope towards eugenics. There is, however, questions to be asked around the well-being of individuals the richness of their life, and the loss of autonomy, things like intellectual disability can actually take from an individual. This is something talked about extensively by parent advocates of what is deemed profound autism. Again, that is for a different video at a different time to discuss properly. The thing is, autism is rarely a standalone occurrence, existing alongside a number of mental health, physical and neurological conditions which can both reduce one's quality of life and reduce one's life expectancy too. The existence of natural inherent difficulties related to autism with things such as sensory issues is noted from my previous discussions online. However, I doubt that it wouldn't be adjusted for as we've adjusted to all aspects of nature and survived as human beings. The autism-centric social world would have a different set of rules, different methods of education, and neurotypicality would be seen as a social deficit in that world, because we are all autistic people. Of course, we aren't living in that world, it is fantasy, but I doubt it wouldn't flourish just as well. One of my main missions within my work has been to elucidate and highlight these co-occurring genetic and social issues that we face. I don't believe that autism should be seen as a disorder, a disability in our world for sure, due to our difference from the norm, but a natural and neutral variation in the human brain. However, 
I do believe that a lot of disorders are not neutral in nature, and here lies my point of contention that I have with a lot of people, that a lot of people have with me. I'm not talking about the spectrum of support needs here, but generally about all human difference. There is a line somewhere. Some people draw it, and others seek never to draw that line at all for fear of backlash and social rejection. For me, it's not all about a capitalist worth to the society's economy, human value or worth, but about the general inherent burden on individuals, potential risk to others, and the overall lived experience combined. Again, if not only to remind anyone, I do not wish for any type of eugenics. It's like the opposite of what I would want. I only wish for proper treatment and classification of genuine pathology on a general scale. I would change a lot of the psychological based medical system. It's definitely not perfect at all. It's full of stigma and misinformation. However, I would wish for more support for those seeking autonomy from the medical system too. There's a lot of worries of eugenics occurring and rights being crossed, but I don't think that an ideology is going to tear down the medical system. What is worth advocating for? The expansion of neurodiversity. The disability movement aims to represent people of all difference, creating awareness, acceptance, education, and battling for their rights. In neurodiversity, this is confined to neurological differences. These differences can be inherent, but they can also be acquired from an injury, experience, the hands of time, and even late expressing phenotypes from that person's genetics. The neurodiversity paradigm suffers a similar fate to the pathology paradigm, being extremely general, black and white, and non-distinguishing. I'd say even more general, as it makes no effort to distinguish between positive and negative. This allows less people to be left out, and indeed larger groups of people, to be under one banner. Frequently, the statement is that neurological differences should not be pathologized. So let's do it a little bit of a little bit of a question time. Let me ask you some questions to try and tease out where you may draw the dreaded line in the sand. I've got three questions here. Do we accept and avoid treating brain injury? or seeking cures for Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. That's number one. Number two, do we foster acceptance, awareness, and education for those with antisocial personality disorder, sociopathy, psychopathy, or those with sadistic and criminal but diagnosable tendencies? Number three, should we as autistic people continue maintaining contact with or engaging with narcissistic individuals who act in line with their disorder, as to not discriminate against them. If these questions raise any feeling or reversion in your mind, I would say that it's probably founded in some sense. It's easy to see that the first group of disorders are not something that we want to leave idly by without treating or curing them on a general scale. They have real negative effects on people's lives. I'd say that this line in the sand is pretty easy to draw, as it is to me, due to my many years visiting my late grandmother. I feel that seeing it as anything other than pathological variation is abhorrent and incredibly disrespectful. My grandma is not that condition. That is not who she is. That is something that she's suffering with. The second question targets those considered to be neurodivergent by virtue of personality or behavioural differences, other than psychopathy, which is inherent at birth. Some of these individuals can be lovely and great human beings subjectively, of course, especially when given extensive and effective treatment. But by the actual nature of how they are diagnosed, it's hard to argue for these disorders being neutral. It doesn't mean that the person is automatically bad, as there are differences in between people within that diagnosis. And of course, a label doesn't automatically mean that their entire existence is malevolent or bad. But we are talking about a label, a concept, a diagnostic profile, and 
not a person. It's only really an issue if that person identifies very strongly with that label as that being their neurodivergency. There is also not a clear line between neurology and personality. Perhaps in the past, these individuals would be imprisoned or cut off socially for doing bad things. But applying a diagnosis for a difference suddenly makes it a diagnosable condition, a neurotype, something falling under the expansive reach of neurodivergency. In the last question, I brought up narcissism, which definitely does have many forms and can look different in everyone, but generally brings with it a ton of antisocial and manipulative behaviours. Autistic people are often at a greater risk to manipulative individuals due to our nature. I mean, just look at the stats. I'm by no means saying that someone with NPD can't be nice, kind, helpful people with proper effective therapy for any manipulative or negative tendencies. Refer back to my previous statement on personality. Applying the social model or neurodiversity paradigm to narcissism is so much different to autism in real life application. Here are a list of some of the common traits related to narcissism. You can make your mind up. Grandiose self-importance. Fantasies of having or deserving. Superiority. Need for admiration. Entitlement. Exploitation of others. Lower empathy. Frequent envy and arrogance. So, let me ask you a further question. If we are to remove the diagnosis element of this, the label that we are debating, and take this person as they are, who have all of these traits, would we want to accept and accommodate someone like this within our own individual lives? I guess it really depends. I don't surround myself with people who demonstrate these traits strongly, but I do know people who do, and it frequently causes dysregulation and dysfunction in their lives, um, pretty constantly. Many will point to the existence of benign narcissists or covert narcissists, people who perhaps don't take advantage or manipulate as much or aren't so overt about it. To them, I say, okay, let's speak about malignant narcissists in this conversation then, because they still land under the idea of, of neurodiversity. Some will point to the mental illness statistics and how the condition often develops out of trauma or unfavorable child environments. And to those people, I would say it isn't something neutral still, but negative in those cases for everyone that is involved. And I actually genuinely wish them to recover. There are, of course, differences between the diagnoses that I've named today. I'd also be ignoring the complexity of human life to say that a diagnosis explains the person and their actions fully. I'm not particularly trying to target people with these specific things, just allow us to sort of understand or, or conceptualize or, or figure out um, how this whole idea of neurodiversity applies to sort of everyday circumstances to individuals or perhaps to a label. And I'm not focusing this towards people who have that condition, just speaking generally about what the label is and whether we should need to consider it neutral and not pathologize it. Nothing to do with their human value or making assumptions about who they are, just base on the basis of the diagnosis. <laughs> Despite what people say, there is a line somewhere in one's brain that you draw when any ideology or belief meets reality. People are diagnosed with horribly disordering, outstandingly negative conditions, and those who commit horrible acts are also labelled with a diagnosis too, something related to their neurology. When speaking about the neurodiversity movement to some, by its nature we include all of these conditions, these differences. But not all of them we would generally consider neutral or positive for the person and people around them. Each condition needs individual assessment, conversation around, not a thoughtless blanket of acceptance and inclusion, 
and a denial of any pathology. It's clear to see that anything laid out by the old neurodiversity movement has been diluted into general acceptance, education and rights without much consideration of what we sort of allow within the social movement banner. Not to say that I'm saying people aren't neurodivergent, it's a label, that's how we refer to people, makes sense that they would be included, but when it comes to the actual sort of tenets of the paradigm and like how we apply it in a social context. To cast a wide net of neurodiverse positivity or neutrality over all of it is to ignore the general reality of many diagnoses. Neurodiversity is not a movement, but a label and a statement, and the neurodiversity paradigm signifies a blanket approach of acceptance and non-pathology to everything different about human brains, which becomes pretty complicated to argue, especially when not adding nuance or testing it against reality. It creates unity, for sure, but it also dilutes the goals of the earlier neurodiversity movements. Whilst the sentiments of inclusion under the label are definitely admirable, an awareness of education are incredibly important for all neurological differences, the breadth of conditions included makes the message to the neurotypical world confusing, especially when we ask for acceptance and not individualised change for those who are negatively impacted and potentially those around them too. Mental illness is not an identity. One of the perhaps most detestable things that I've heard from some advocates is that mental illnesses like depression and anxiety are something to consider outside of the pathology paradigm. This sentiment strikes hard for me personally as someone who has battled with severe treatment resistant depression and chronic anxiety for the majority of life ever since the age of 12 or 13. For sure, people like myself have significant brain changes due to the chronic nature of the condition and would classify as neurodivergency. But I'd say it is pretty right and pretty okay to pathologize it. Why do I think mood disorders like depression are a pathology? Well, other than writing depressing poetry and making depressive art, there is no discernible redeeming objective positives to it. Sure, it can get grips into your psychology and make you believe all these horrible things about yourself and your life, but I don't identify with depression. I suffer from it. My mood changes, but it's never a part of my identity. Some people accept that existence, and that is fine. Medication and therapy does not work for everyone, for sure. But do we need to reframe it as a stable part of our identity? Can some things just not be included in our identity? I don't feel any shame for being depressed. I didn't become depressed purposefully or have a depressed nature. It's a disease. It's not who I am as a person. That is abundantly clear when I have my random mild symptom days that happen around once every two months. I feel great. I feel on top of the world. I feel confident. I feel myself. When I'm depressed, I'm, it's, it's awful. It's just, it's, it's, it's definitely something which is negative and I do not identify with it in the slightest. Whilst it's productive to self-advocate for your autistic needs and preferences, encouraging advocating for depression and not seeking immediate treatment is the path to much more darker outcomes. I don't want psychologists to accept my toxic self-beliefs about myself, no matter what, if I claim that it's a part of my identity. I want them to help change them, or challenge them at least. I want them to fix it. I want to not be depressed. I do not want to not be autistic, because I would be a completely different person. We don't have to root identity within everything about ourselves especially something so fluctuating in nature as our mood state. In the case of depression, we don't want to accept those dark feelings and thoughts and just keep them around. We seek therapy, we take medication, we talk through it. Not because it just happens to help us, but we are actively trying to treat and cure a neurological difference that we have. Cure it. Depression. 
I would love to. <laughs> we need to discuss these things. What do we consider to be bad or negative? We need something to target when producing treatments for things. That is the, the reality of how the medical system works. And I don't think that the neurodiversity paradigm is going to change that. What if things that we don't consider to be a diagnosis, but we highlight as negative, eventually become a diagnosis? We create some SUI ideation disorder out of depression because too many people identify with the aspects of depression. Do, do we need to see, find a, a new identity within that? Without a question, whether it's pathological or not? Am I going to be an, an SUI warrior? <laughs> you know? It's, it's, it's just boggles my brain to think about, honestly. You can see from all that we have talked about, about how shaky applying such a widespread ideology can be without giving it some semblance of boundaries or without drawing some kind of line somewhere, adding some type of nuance to it. Whilst neurodiversity is a label, the neurodiversity paradigm is a perspective with, in my opinion, a lot of flaws. The neurodiversity movement once had a direction, a manifesto in a sense, and I believe that the message it holds has been diluted. Conclusion. Let us talk about the things that I've talked about today and some caveats. Try to summarise my points, because I realise that sometimes when I'm talking about things as complex as <laughs> neurodiversity and disability, I really want to get all my words out on it and not say like a tiny thing wrong that's going to like spiral in people's brains and make them hyper focus on and clip it and you know you, you know what I mean. I just want to make sure that I'm communicating effectively on something that's very complex and obviously like very personal to a lot of people. But I, 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 th I think that it's worthwhile to talk about. I think whilst I don't want people to see this video and go, okay, hey, I agree with this and thanks for changing my mind, Tom. I want there to be a discussion about it. I want people to be able to talk about this, to be able to sort of have a dialogue about the whole idea of neurodiversity so that we make it as good as it can be and as applicable as it can be in the future. You know, it's not an argument necessarily. It's just wanting to start a dialogue around it to hopefully help sort of solidify the, the different aspects of what we consider neurodiversity. So I hope that the words in this video aren't misconstrued as being anti-disability or anti-diversity. I believe and support in those causes for both philosophical and for personal reasons. I've worked in these fields both online and in my formal workplace experience, and I'm by no means an Aspie supremacist. You know, I've worked in supporting and inspiring children across the entire sort of needs spectrum. Of, of support needs and cared for them very, very deeply, understand them and value them as human beings. What I object to is the erasure of the original neurodiversity movement. The erasure of the desire to argue and debate neutrality or pathology and add nuance to the neurodivergencies that we are speaking on. I believe specific differences should not be desired to be fixed or treated on a general scale, but adjusted for and allowed to flourish for the good of the person and the world around them. Specific differences. I think others should be viewed in a pathological lens and treated some things. Although my motives may seem anti-disability to some from the greater disability movement, I don't believe them to be so. I am still very much disabled in many ways due to my differences from the norms and resulting mental illness I have accrued from negative experiences that I've had on this earth. For myself, the motive of the older neurodiversity movement is still compelling and still drives me within the work that I do. What better way to turn the minds of policymakers, business heads and the world away from treating autism, ADHD and other minds as a charity effort to viewing us as different people with unique minds, perceptions, abilities. This is actually one of the main problems that the government has in raising disabled employment, actually convincing the businesses to do so. 
and I would know because I have worked in this area. My goal in all of my work is to make things better for autistic people. I deeply hate hearing all of the pain in our community, and I believe that the old manifesto of neurodiversity, the sort of social movement behind the label, still holds quite valid and strong, despite what ideological disputes may exist. Fighting and educating others on how society mistreats us is sure to convince many to our cause and mission, even policymakers and change makers, but not all. The harsh truth is that the large majority of humans have almost no awareness or understanding of neurodiversity, human rights or disability rights. Many see it as a deficit or disorder or something to pity. Detractors online make fun of neurodivergent people in their efforts to educate and change minds. Even those who succeed in the upper echelons of their profession, to which there are many, aren't seen as neurodivergent people and or aren't open about their nature. There are of course many more who go unnoticed and many who never get to realise their potential due to these social barriers that we face. I hope it's been clear in this video that it's not my plan or motive to deny others autonomy over their own brain and body. There is nothing immoral about denying inherent disorder and discussing the neurodiversity movement in generality. However, I would say it's counterproductive to deny another's lived experience. We are all different and I can't deny one's own conceptualization of autism or disability whatever they have and their experience. But that doesn't stop me from trying to shift general perspectives. My aim is also not to dismantle or gatekeep a label either. I think it would be silly considering the widespread adoption of it and its commonly understood meaning of difference. Difference in neurology, diversity in neurology. I just don't wish for the old goals and message to die out. I've seen the real positive impact that they've had in person within businesses and establishments and within people's lives. Perhaps I'd wish for a fresh new banner for the old movement, but I doubt it would draw anything but controversy and fighting and name calling. Truly, I don't know the answer to this quandary. It's complex and multifaceted in so many different ways with so many social and political factors involved. Will this dissipation of the old neurodiversity movement prevent change? No, I don't think so. I don't think that those who have already set the roots of this ideology will ever change or even attempt to draw attention to difficult questions around what we consider under sort of the general movements and aims that we have as a collective group, in a sense. I do, of course, have nothing but love and respect for those who fight for us, no matter if they agree or not with the things that I say about autism and neurodiversity, and they fight in a way that often results in a net positive result. The intentions of love and acceptance are definitely not lost on me in the slightest, but the potential consequences do worry me, and the logic of the movement extending to all diagnoses is a little bit shaky to say the least. I don't think it will ever be fully understood and well received by the majority of people, this kind of neurodiversity paradigm, unless we add more easily understood and logically sound nuance to it. I hope that you view this as more of an active contribution to the discussion on the nature of autism and neurodivergency and not a active declaration of war or gatekeeping. I'm very willing to shift my perspective if arguments make sense to me, perhaps this will open up a discussion around the much needed nuance of the neurodiversity paradigm's ideological components on a wide and general scale. That would be the best thing that could come out of this video for me. If you feel attacked, rest assured I'm not trying to target individuals. You have your own life experience, sense of identity and personal insight. I'm talking generally, of course, about labels and not people. Speaking of things generally requires acknowledgement of outliers, subjectivity within individuals, and also factoring in just, just human nature. 
My discussion, of course, pales in comparison to the general positive push towards lasting change for disabled people. But I hope that at the least this gave you some food for thoughts and I'd love to hear your thoughts too. More than ever, I dearly wish you well and best of luck in your own life path, wherever that takes you. Take care. Also remember to like and subscribe if you like this. <laughs> if you want to hear some more things like this, don't even know how long I've been recording for. An hour and a half. Okay. I'm going to have a real job editing this down. <laughs> oh my lordy. Uh, if you haven't already, please go check out my new channel Inside the Autiverse, where all the new commentary and sort of reaction videos are going on to. Um, I'd really appreciate the support so we can get us to a thousand subscribers. That is the goal for now. And um, if you want to support me on my journey, you can become a member, watch all the live streams ahead of time, uncut with all the funny bits and things that I've edited out in, in my clips. It's not, not really often that I do long talking rants, discussions, video essays, on various different things. And uh, I would love to hear what you think about this. 100%. Let me know, please, in the comments.